today, but we can still have the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I want to just give a quick testimony. We have some prayer. Uh, Sister Norma Valencia cannot make it. I believe she's watching via Facebook, and she's just not able to be here. And uh, thankful for what the Lord has done in her life. It's been about almost a year since she has been living for the Lord. And, uh, and uh, so we're thankful for that. And we'll pray for her, Sister Darlene. If you ever go to Crackle Barrel, ask for Sister Darlene. There and uh, she's not feeling well tonight too. And uh, she's a she's a good good woman and she'll talk your ear off. And she's been baptized in the name of Jesus as the Holy Ghost. Thank you for that. And, uh, if you're watching on Facebook below, and uh, I'll, I'll probably stop by Crackle Barrel when you get off so I can get thirty percent off this week. <laughs> Amen. So to God's been good. But recently, if those that know me, I uh, when I preach and uh, my voice will go out. I struggle with sinus infections. About twice a year, I would get sick with an infection. And I was preaching for uh, Brother Sansa. And many of you know him in Phoenix, obviously, now. And he was in, in town. And his youth leader was in town. But his youth leader, uh, his wife was expecting a baby. And so they had to have I me. Mean, I guess I was like the fifth, sixth, seventh choice or something like that. You know, I'm fine with that. <laughs> You can use anyone, Lord, I don't care. I'll, I'll, I'll be used. Teasing just a bit. But uh, my voice wasn't going well, and all of a sudden I could feel that that, that, that allergy stuff, you know. And uh, It's that time of year. And so I told the Lord this. I said, God, I need you to touch my voice. I have to preach. You've spoken to me. I have a word of knowledge from you. I'm going to just do whatever I can to, just to preach to these good people. And while I was preaching... And God was, was in the preaching. I'm thankful for that. I felt the hand of the Lord touch my throat. I could feel it freeze up. And He touched my throat. And then I began to continue to preach. And then it happened again. And then He touched me a second time. And, I, and, and then it happened again. And He touched me a third time. And guess what? Someone received the gift of the Holy Ghost that day to God be the glory. But He touched me three times. He touched me three times. And normally I'm sick. Now I know that this may be a sin. Testimony or simple healing, but I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I just can't afford anything to stop. And normally I'm sick, but I'm not sick today. The Lord healed me, and the Lord touched me. Amen. Amen. So God be the glory for it. Why am I telling you that? Number one, I'm telling you because we want to give praise to God. Number two, if the Lord can heal me in such a small manner, the Lord can heal you. Amen. And God can use you to go pray for the sick. And I believe that will happen. I'm thankful for those that are able to. We, uh, and I may get a little choked up. Uh, you know, we know and we're thankful for heaven. That our, uh, one of our pillars, Brother Elder, uh, I call him Elder, a longtime assistant pastor, Faith Tabernacle as a whole, to Bishop Connor, a pastor, passed away. And so we had to change some plans. Uh, did some door hangers yesterday just around the corner. And I know everybody couldn't make it. Thankfully, it only took 20 minutes. And we, every dog in the neighborhood was barking. <laughs> Johnny wanted to go to Sister Missy's uh, house right there. They, they got a big dog. You'll, you'll know who it is if you ever pass through. He said, I'm going to go hang it there so they know we're here. And I said, you're going to get eaten up. <laughs> and I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to be mad. And if you make it alive, I'm going to slap you. <laughs> Something like that. He said, I was thinking those things. Uh, but everybody deserves a chance to hear the gospel. At least an invitation. And so we're going to plant some seed. We're going to throw it. We're going to do what the has us to do. We're going to witness to our co-workers and we're going to do whatever we can do and that person may not come to the Lord, but God will send someone else. Amen. He'll send someone else. And so we're happy about that. We'll have some more opportunity for you to labor with the Lord and, and, uh, and do that. We know our elders, all our good elders, thank you for being here. You, you have a good reason. If you want to stay home, and you can. And, uh, but I'm encouraged that you come. I really am. You come to church. And so when I grow up, I want to be just like you. Just like you. Praise God. Amen. So we're going to ask our, our ushers, our young little ushers, are going to come up here. And don't worry, they don't have any guns or anything like that. And, and uh, we're going to give up to the Lord. Why don't you meet someone else that doesn't have a word here?
her son Lucas, who may have given a hand clap. They are. Jesus' name. 
Hallelujah. So I want to let you know tonight, I say this a lot to where I'm preaching. I say this a lot, that I am an evangelist. And I don't see saved people when I preach. I just see people who need to go to heaven. Right. And I'm going to do whatever I have to do tonight to pray, to preach, somehow to get you into heaven. Amen. 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 That's my job. And so I've, I've said this also before, that if you don't want me praying for you, if you'll act saved, <laughs> I may leave you alone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Acts chapter number one. Good to see you with us. Mr. Connor here. Very much. I give you honor today. From the bottom of my heart. And I mean that. Um, you guys are special to me. Acts chapter number one. <clears throat> verse number 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said about the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs to be fulfilled. Which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now, this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and fallen headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. What, what a horrible scripture to read. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue the Kelma, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. What, what a horrible ending to a life. He got so caught up in his sin thought the only way to deal with it was to take his life. Got so caught up with sin and decisions that he made that he looked around and thought, there is no other recourse for me but to just take my life. What, what, a, what a horrible ending of a life. First John, first chapter, Verse number 5. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you, speaking of Jesus, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say then we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. So just for a little while today, I want to preach on this subject. You don't have to die in your dilemma. You don't have to die in your dilemma. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Thank you so much for standing. Every once in a while, somebody will see that I don't have a hanky will bring me one, and I always ask, is this used? <laughs> That's the last thing you need. <laughs> Wiping somebody's dirty hanky all across your face. <laughs> In John chapter number 10, verse number 10, we read that our adversary is seeking to do three things to our life. He's wanting to steal, He's wanting to kill and He's wanting to destroy. He doesn't start by destroying. He starts very small. And Satan is relentless in his attack on us. If you think that you're going to have a good service on a Sunday, you're going to shout, you're going to love God, you're going to worship, God is going to touch you, God's going to forgive you, 
God is going to bless your spirit. If you think that the devil looks at you and says, well, they're unreachable. I'm just going to give up on them. You've got another thing coming. Because as you walk out the door, he's going to meet you. <laughs> Sometimes he'll meet you before you even get to the back door. He'll meet you with somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, you've got to understand this today. There's a reason why us Pentecostals have pews. And then we have aisles. The reason why we have aisles is we like to separate some people from other people. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's how we stay saved in a church. <laughs> because anytime you've been in church for very long, and there's a lot of people around you, you're bound to find somebody that you don't get along with. <laughs> I'm going to pastor just for a minute before I get to be an evangelist, all right? That's just going to happen. It's just going to happen. And I, I know it happens. Because you can see people that got their kids and they've got their Bible in their purse and they're dragging their husband and they go to, <laughs> and they're gonna walk up an aisle and they'll see somebody that they don't want to see and they'll change directions <laughs> and they'll go the other direction to sit somewhere else. That's how we keep everybody saved, is we have sections so that you can Sit over here because somebody doesn't like somebody to sit over there. Now I am being a little bit facetious, but there's a lot of truth to that. Because if you have more than one kid, you understand what that means. I mean, I think that all my kids love each other until they all get together. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're at each other's throat and they're asking me to spank one of them because they're mad at them. And I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> so I don't spank my kids when you get mad at them. I spank my kids when I get mad at them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just want to say this today. That Satan is relentless in his attack against you. He doesn't care who he has to use to get you offended. He doesn't care who he has to use to get you sideways with one another. He will do whatever he has to do. He'll get someone ignoring you. He'll get somebody to talk to you. He will get somebody maybe to pass by you and not shake your hand. And all of a sudden you'll begin to ask yourself, what's wrong with them? Do they like me? Do, 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 they, do they have something against me? Did I do something? Small, very small things that Satan will get you to start thinking about. Oh, I bet when that preacher was preaching, he was preaching right at me. And you know what? Don't flatter yourself. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about you. <laughs> we, I'm going to offend somebody tonight, I know, before I leave. <laughs> But it's the truth. I, I remember somebody telling me one day, you walked right by me and didn't even say anything. I was like, you know, I saw you before and I talked to you. I thought the second time that I didn't have to say anything. But I, you know, I, I didn't know I had to come by and every time I walked by you, I had to hold a conversation. I was like, I, and this is somebody that was in my church. I was like, you know, I, I thought that you would allow me to go talk to other people. I didn't know that you wanted me to be a one-on-one -on -one guy for the rest of my life with you. <laughs> because people are looking. Something in their spirit. Uh, Satan loves to, to tell you things that are not true. That person just doesn't li like you. That person hasn't even thought about you all day. But he wants you to think small things. Small things. To get you sideways. So that when God goes to use them with you, you're already mad at that person and you say, no, I don't think I want to. And all of a sudden, just something small gets in our spirit. I don't know what got in Judas' spirit. I don't know. I don't know how he got his 
mind so messed up with Jesus. I don't know if it was the time where it, they were, somebody came to worship Jesus, fell down at His feet, broke an alabaster box, broke it upon, uh, began to pour it on Jesus' head, began to soak His feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. I, I don't know if that was the reason because He spoke out and said, Hey, why, why is she wasting all of this? We could have sold all of this for a lot of money and given it to the poor. And he said, hey, Judas, the poor you have always. He said, but me, you don't have very much. And he spoke kind of harsh to him. I don't know. Maybe something got in his spirit. Maybe something got a little bit sideways. And he started getting so deep into his decisions that somewhere it got so bad and he got so eaten up with everything that was going on in his life that he somehow betrayed Jesus. How can you go from just being a little sideways to somebody to betraying them and watching them die? Listen, I want to tell you today that uh, Satan wants you to get to that point. He wants you to get to that point where you think that you've just gone too far. That your sin is just too big. That all of your decisions that you've made all of your life have led you here. I've isolated people. I've said things that I can't take back. I've done things that I can't pull back. I just, there's some things that I've done that there's just no way that I'm going to maneuver my way out of this and the best thing for me to do is just walk out of church and never come back I want to tell you that's the lie of the devil you need to understand that God doesn't want you to die in your deliverance because there, there's times that we get that way we just think maybe we've gone too far maybe, maybe we've just said too many things maybe, maybe we've had too many broken promises but I want to tell you, Satan is patient. Oh, he doesn't mind small victories. He wants to get you so entangled in sin that one day you just throw up your hands and give up. Judas allowed himself to, to get so entangled in his failure and to all of his failures took a hold of his life and Judas couldn't handle it and Judas took his life. I want to tell you today this is where Satan wants you to get. He wants you to think that you're no longer usable. He wants you to think that you're no longer ever going to be blessed. That if you do, be, if you are going to be saved, it's going to be by the skin of your teeth. That you're barely going to make it. That you're not worth what anybody else is worth. That if you leave the church the church really ain't going to miss you and the church is just going to keep on going. I want to tell you today, stop listening to the voice of Satan. There is a God that loves you beyond your failure and beyond your entanglement and beyond everything that you've done and he sent me to tell you today that you do not have to die in your doom. Amen. You don't have to so we have to understand how God works. We have to understand what mercy really is. We have to understand that how much God loves us. The Bible tells us things. And He says things like a bruised reed will He not break. And a smoky flask He will not snuff out. Now look, you have to drink a lot of smart water to figure that out, alright? And I'll be honest with you today. I was, uh, that's the reason why I'm fixing to explain to you what that means. <laughs> Some scriptures that we read in, in the Bible, sometimes we read them and they just, they just, they just don't make sense. And instead of taking the time to figure out what that means, we just kind of, okay, we just kind of breeze through it. But let me tell you something. This is what it means. That if, you, if you've ever played or seen someone play a, what they call a woodwind instrument, it is an instrument that has to have a reed, a small, small, insignificant sheep little piece of wood that is a reed that you put on an instrument and it gets wet and you begin to blow across it and it makes sound and you begin to play music with this reed. Now let me tell you something. 
and getting wet and then getting dried out and getting wet and getting dried out, that reed that is so cheap, that is so insignificant, that is uh, able to be, uh, that, that it has to the, to the uh, how much ever you paid for uh, the instrument itself, that reed is insignificant to the cost of that wonderful instrument. But the instrument, no matter how much it costs, it's useless without that. Right. Right. <laughs> and some of you allow Satan to tell you that you're not worth anything. That the church is so wonderful and so big and so powerful and so awesome that you are insignificant and you'll never, never really uh, matter to the church and matter to God. But I'm telling you right now, he said a bruised dream. Uh, you can find them anywhere. When you go and buy them, they come in packages. And they're cheap. They don't cost much. And back in those days, they made them so quick and so cheap that you could just break one and you would just throw it in the trash and you'd find another one and you'd keep right on going. God said, hey, a bruised reed, that broken reed, that bruised reed. He said, I am not going to cast it away. I don't care how broken you think you are. I don't care how insignificant you think you are. I don't care what the devil has told you about your life. There is a God that says, I'll put you up together again. I'll help you. You do not have to die in the situation that you're in. You can repent. stuff out. This is really even more insignificant than the reading. For it was just things that you could find on the side of the road. You kind of twine twi them together and put them in a little bit of oil and light it and it would be able to, to give light to you. It was just a piece of flax. It was just some insignificant, cheap, throwaway stuff. And he took that and he put it together put it in the middle of some oil and they would light it and it would make beautiful flames and give you light for your dark home, but then somewhere of being used so much that it would stop giving it off light. And when you light it, it would just smoke and it would smoke and ugly black smoke would rise up and it would be nasty. And, and so what you do is you just reach in there and you'd pull that out, throw it in the trash and you'd pick up something else, put it in there and use it and it was insignificant to you. This is what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, hey, even if you think that there's no way that anything good can come out from me again. I, I've gone too far. I, I've done things that I don't think that I'll ever get out of. I, 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 I've said things. I've done things. I, I've just positioned myself to where it doesn't seem like anything great will ever come out of me again. I'm telling you, God says, hey, a smoky flax, I am not going to snuff out. I know you think that the, that the fire has gone out of our relationship. He said, but I can put it back together. I want to tell you today, the devil is talking to somebody and telling you that there's no way that you'll ever be significant again. You're, God's never going to be able to raise you back to that place where he said that you're going to be. I want to tell you today, the devil is a liar. The I devil is a liar. And there is a God that knows how to use you and to help you. Hallelujah. There was a story in the Bible of a man that was filled with the devil. They called him the demoniac of Gadara. He was living part of his life in the tombs. The Bible says that he was cutting himself on a daily basis. That night and day, he cried and screamed and cut himself. Every day and every night, he lived in the tombs, away from his family, away. Many a times in the middle of the torment that he was in, many people came and tried to put irons on him, try to put chains, try to put anything that would tame him and, and calm him down, but 
nothing. He broke all of them. And he lived in this place. I don't know how he got there. I know it wasn't overnight. I know it wasn't just one decision. But somewhere, somehow, he allowed the devil to get a small little place put in him. And it wasn't long for the devil had brought 2,000 devils that were living inside this man. This man lived in the tombs overlooking this small lake, the small sea that we know is the Sea of Galilee. Just a small sea. You could stand on one side and you could see the other side. It was not something that looked like one of our, us when we go to the ocean and we look out and we think, wow, that, that's a way out there. It's just as far as the eye can see. But here, you could stand on one shore and you could see the other. But somewhere, he began to watch a boat. And men got in that boat and started toward him. Because on the other side, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Now his disciples had no idea of why he was headed to the other side. He was having great revival where he was. Listen to me. I, listen to me. He was having great revival where he was. But Jesus said, hey, it's time to shut this down. And let's go to the other side. The Bible said that while he was going to the other side, that a great storm came and it absolutely wrecked that boat. The Bible said the disciples woke Jesus up and said, Carest thou not? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You've been around Jesus and you're looking at Jesus and saying, Hey, I know who you are. You're God manifested in the flesh. But you don't care that we're dying. So carest thou not that we perish? The Bible said that Jesus... Step to the bow of boat. Now, let me tell you, there's a reason why Jesus does everything. There's a reason why Jesus does everything. The Bible said he stepped to the bow of the boat. And he walked all the way to the front because he wanted somebody to see him. He could have, he could have been back there with his disciples. He could have been back there and laid down in his bed and just said, hey, stop it. We, we're going on vacation. Stop. And, and all, everything would have been cool. But he said, no, that's, I'm not doing this for my, for my disciples. I've already told them we're going to go to the other side. They shouldn't be worried about it. This storm is not here to sink the boat. This storm is here so that I can show somebody that I care for them. And the Bible says, Jesus calmed us, said, peace be still. And calm the sea. And then the Bible says they went on to the other side. And immediately there met him a man out of the tombs of Gadara came running down. You know what? why he came running down? He looked and said, there's a man. And if he can calm the storm out there, he can calm the storm that's in right. here. <laughs> And the Bible says that 2,000 devils couldn't hold him back from going and worshiping Jesus. Why? Because he said, you know what? I've watched somebody. I've watched numerous times. For I've, I've, I've been up here a long time overlooking this great sea. And I've overlooked many storms that have sunk many, many boats. And all of a sudden, there's one one boat that the storm had to listen to. And the Bible said that Jesus stepped out of that boat and he met him. And he said, hey, if you could calm the storm out there, you could calm the storm in here. And the Bible said the next time they saw him, they saw him clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. I want to tell you today that Jesus came to this service because there's some people that have some storms on the inside of them. They don't know how they're going to get out of it. They're praying about it. They have people to talk to them about it. But I want to tell you, Jesus has come and said, I'm going to calm that storm tonight. I've come because I'm the master of change. I know how to change your life. I want to tell you this today, that God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost more than you even want the Holy Ghost. I believe that God wants to heal you more than you even want to be healed. You don't have to twist God's arm. You don't have to twist God's arm. He wants to help you more than you even want to be helped. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible 
Bible said that Jesus looked at his disciples one day and said, it, I must need to go through Samaria. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You've you got to drink smart water. <laughs> but if you, if you don't really do a little bit of background on, on, on Jesus, nobody, nobody wants to go to Samaria. You know, there's towns around here. There's probably towns around here that you all know of. And nobody wants to say, hey, we've got a little time today. Why don't we go down here to... Every one of you are thinking about somewhere right now, but you don't want to say it because you're afraid of somebody that's here lives there. <laughs> but we all have that place that nobody, nobody is thinking about. You know what? It's vacation time. Guys, where do you want to go? Oh, we want to go. And you're like, what? No, seriously. <laughs> That's a funny joke. <laughs> but no. <laughs> where do you really want to go? Let me tell you something. Nobody wants to go to Samaria. Nobody. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I must. There is a need that I must go through Samaria. Samaria wasn't a town that you walked through to go to another town. It's the town you had to go out of the way to. And when you got there, they were not the greatest people to be around. I'll tell you this. Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. So much so that He told His disciples, go into the city and buy some food. And sent them away because He knew that He was fixing to talk to somebody that nobody in his entourage would have liked him talking to. And so Jesus sent him all the way and sat down at a well. And the Bible makes it plain that if you drink smart water, you'd know <laughs> that it was in the middle of the day. It was in the middle of the day. Let me tell you something. Nobody goes to the well at the middle of the day. You, you want to know why? What is that? Because, number one, it's hot. Okay? It's very, very hot. And everybody, every woman that was that was in the city that was going to go out to get water for the family all came in the morning. Every last one of them. They would come early in the morning because it was cool. Number two, they would come because all the wells water was fresh, undisturbed, and they were getting the best water. All the sediment had settled in the bottom. It was nice, clean, wonderful water. And number three, there was strength in numbers. They didn't ever have to worry about someone jumping them, someone coming in and robbing them, because there was enough of them to come together. But Jesus said, I'm going to go in the middle of the day. Not going to be very good water, because it's going to be hot. It's going to be full of mud. There's not going to be much there. But there's going to be one person that really didn't want to come with everybody else. She didn't want to come with everybody else because she didn't want everybody talking about her. So the Bible says that she had five husbands. And the one that she was with now was not even her own. She was shacking up with somebody else's husband that didn't even want to give her his name. Nobody wanted to be around this woman. So when everybody came to the well in the morning, when it was cool, she didn't come. She waited until everybody was gone. And she brought her water pot, carried it by herself. And she came to the well by herself. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this today. That Jesus sees your life. He sees everything that you think. He sees everything that the devil has told you about yourself. Now I'm telling you right now, God knows how to look at the broken and say, hey, I'm after you. You're just as important as anybody else. This woman came by herself and she's there with Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, I'm coming for you. I've sent everybody away. I know everything is not good at this well but you and I are going to have a talk and we're going to get down to business and I'm going to help you I'm going to give you water that you will never thirst again I'm going to give you a life that you can be proud of I'm going to tell you today that God cares about every one of you He cares about your life He cares about your mind and your spirit He doesn't want you to die in your dilemma He said, I've come to die for you. I've come to 
give my life so that you might be saved. I came to give everything that I have because you're worth dying for. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Probably one of my favorite, favorite stories in all of the Bible. It's found in a very small, obscure book called Hosea. The Bible says it was a, was a prophet, was a man of God. God told him, I want you to go down to the red light district. And I want you to go and marry a wife that was a prostitute. Now, I'm going to tell you, when he walked back to his church, he probably had some answering to do. <laughs> I'm sure that when he walked back into church, everybody knew he was a man of God. And when he walked back into church and on his arm was a prostitute, I'm, I'm sure that got, people started talking and, uh, and, and I, I, I promise you there was probably some people that just braved the subject and walked up to him and said, do you know what she is? And he's just like, yeah, I, I want to know how you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who she is. This wasn't a good situation. The Bible says, here's this man of God, here's this prophet, and he comes home, the prostitute marries him. The Bible said they start having children. One day the prophet comes home, and the children look at dad, and he says, hey, where's mom? And they go, well, she left earlier today and didn't come back. She says she was going out in the market to get some food, and she's never been back. He said, that's weird. I waited a little bit, and then all of a sudden he goes, well, man, maybe something happened to her, and so he started walking through town. You get to talk to people. Hey, do you see my wife? Yeah. Do you know where she is? Yeah. Is she at the market? Mm -hmm. She's not at the market. She's, she's she's past the market. She's back where she came from. And she said, oh, sure, surely not. No, no, she's married now. We've got a beautiful family and beautiful children. And they're like, hey, you know. You should have known this. I mean, come on. The Bible says that he walks past the market and goes down. And he finds her. Not just wandering around down there. The Bible said he found her in the arms of her lover. Not walking back from his house, but found her in the arms of her lover. And the Bible said that God told him to take her back and love her. He did, took her back. This began to happen over and over again. Until when he came, usually he'd come home, he wouldn't even talk to the kids. He just knew that she wasn't there. He didn't go to the market, he didn't talk to any friends. He knew exactly where to find her. The Bible says that he found her over and over, but one day he went and he couldn't find her. Even there, he couldn't find her. Back walking home, he walks by an old auction where they were auctioning off old cows and old camels and, and just animals and there she is standing dirty wore out ugly standing up there and they are selling this woman like they would an animal the Bible says that Jesus our God says I want you to, to buy her back I want you to buy her and so they begin to auction this woman off. And I have a great imagination. I can just imagine how this auction would go. I've been to auctions and you have to start bidding. You have to raise your hand and say, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll bid so much. And I'm sure there was somebody who needed a maid or needed somebody maybe to clean out the pig pen or something. They thought, well, I can get her cheap enough. She can work out there and, and uh, just spend for herself. And they said, you know, I'll give a couple pennies. And all of a sudden... God speaks to Hosea and says, now I want you to buy her. And he says, hey, I'll give you $100. And they look at him like, uh, man, you know, you jump from a couple of pennies all the way to 100 I mean, I, I mean, good for us, but man, you, maybe five pennies would have kind of been 
what, what, what she's worth. And he, he lifts his hand up again and says, I'll give you 200 And they said, sir, there's nobody bidding now but you. Uh oh I'll give you 300 And they say, sir, we don't understand what you're doing. Well, what, what, are you, what are you doing? I want to tell you this is what I believe. I believe he was trying to show her. I'm not buying you for what everybody else thinks you are. I'm buying you for what I think you are. And I need to buy you with the ultimate price. So that you once again look at yourself like I'm worth it. Something. I'm worth something. Hallelujah. I want to tell you in this house today, I don't care what the devil's told you. I don't care what you've thought about yourself. I don't care of what maybe somebody has said to you that has hurt your feelings or, or something that you've done in your past that keeps you from really believing what you're worth. But Jesus said, let me tell you how much I think you're worth. I'm not going to buy you from what you think you're worth. I'm going to buy you with my precious blood because I'm going to tell you what I think you're worth. today and just right where you are can we begin to pray right now and let the Holy Ghost move in this house right now I believe that God wants to talk to somebody God wants to speak to somebody right now and somebody in this house needs to realize that I've come in this house I didn't really think much about myself I've got some things that I'm entangled with I don't know how God's going to get me out of this but the preacher come to tell me that I don't have to die in this dilemma that God is one to bring me out God is one to forgive me God is one to save me God is one to lift me up and exalt me Tell me that I'm worth more than I thought I was. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for what you've done for us, God. I pray for every person in this house. I pray that the Holy Ghost would move in this place and touch every life in this place today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're going to respond to God right now. We're going to respond to God. Hallelujah. I feel like asking today if you need God. You want God to touch you. Maybe there's an enemy that's been lying to you. Maybe there's some things in your life that you've just, just, you've just had a, a battle with. And you're thinking, I wonder if I could ever get rid of this. And can I ever push this away? Can I ever get past this? I want to tell you there's a God that is saying if you'll step out and you'll respond to me, I'm going to show you today that I know how to forgive. I know how to change. I know how to love you. I know how to save you. I know how to change your life. If you're here today and you want to pray, I'm asking you right now, all over this house, would you come and would you stand across this front? That's just a token of our, our showing that today I'm going to show God, God, I believe your voice greater than I believe the voice of the enemy. That the enemy's told me that I'm not worth much, but there's a God that's going to tell me that I'm worth much. Jesus, every heart, every life, every soul, in the name of Jesus, this city is worth something. Do you hear me? I said this city is worth something. It's worth you giving everything that you have for it. Close your eyes, let's pray together. Oh, let's pray together. In the name of Jesus, let's pray together. In Jesus' name, touch every life in this house.
Ramashita Torre Mahalo. 